Welcome, Zina, to Tadivari, uh, to the smaller version of Kalivari International Festival. Welcome and thank you for likening us into your apartment, if, if I can see correctly. No, my, yeah, my house, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. lovely, by the way, I love it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so embarrassing. I didn't know which room to go in, and then I realized like, this is the best room because there's like a lot of light, and I, I feel like the children won't come in here. <laughs> so yeah. we're fingers crossed that they don't come in here. Yeah, we're going to handle children, no worry. Uh, <laughs> I've read somewhere that you came up uh, with the idea of, of Luxor while dreaming. Is it true? Yeah, it's such a, it's such a, it sounds like such a crazy story, um, but I actually was in this room before I went to bed, and in, in this corner over here you can watch TV, it's like, like, um, and I was watching a movie, um, and I only had two children at the time, now I have three, and my two children were asleep, And I was just like really sad because a film that I was meant to be making, um, we needed a tiny bit of money from someone because we had all the other, it was like a jigsaw. Anyway, it didn't have, it, it, that day I found out I wasn't going to be making it and I was so depressed. And that night I went to bed and I had a dream. And when I'd been watching TV, it was like a movie that was set somewhere really beautiful and like far away and I was like it's so not transported somewhere when you watch a, a film and I don't normally think like that but I was like wow it's just so nice that when I'm so down I was transported so that night I dreamt of Luxor which I'd been to when I was probably like um, 12, 12, 13 years old with my parents and um, and I just I just had this idea and this notion of looking around and there were all the emotions of the film But it was I had to start articulating it, you know. So that's then that was the next stage. Yeah. So you you've dreamt like exactly about Luxor. Why why that? Like you had some experience or no? No, no. I think you know. I think Luxor because I'm you know my I'm um I'm half my mother's Eastern European and my dad is um Arabic. Um, I think the uh. You know, there's like the Arab world, and what's great about the Arab world is that it has layers of history. So you have like ancient Egypt, Roman, um, then you have all like the kind of Islamic history, and then you have um, c contemporary, modern, like political Middle East. So I, I love those layers of history because you can tell a film, you can tell a story in a film without many words when you much stuff around you, you know? It's like you... Um, almost absorb it and so a lot of the story which is about uh, you know the battle between light and dark and hope and uh, civilizations and war and PTSD all these things um, are kind of there in the stones of the place and like the multi-layered history if that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah it, it does yeah it, it was I kind of felt like what, what you just described like when when uh, Hannah was uh, visiting uh, the temple and she just she was just looking at the at the walls and so on. that was yeah. quite intense I would say yeah yeah and you it's an intense place. sorry it's an intense place and also when you start to study it because you know obviously I do I take my research really seriously so I had one of the top archaeologists around Salima Ikram who also acts in it and I also had these other women who were like kind of they were like there to teach me about the whole new age um, you know spiritual thing that goes on there and it was really interesting they agreed with the archaeologists and they were all the same they just had different words they used different language but they were being on it so um, Yeah, like all those images you see are very deliberate. They're like chosen because I was told that this means this or this means this or this temple has. And what I was saying some the other day in an interview, which was really funny, is that um, I never really. Um, I always watch a film, and then I would ask the experts, "Listen, I need like your geography. I need this. Where can I find it in the temple?" But I would always choose from my gut when it would happen. And all the different um, temples I shot in, apparently I always chose the thing called the birthing chamber, which I thought was really interesting because the film is all about birth and rebirth, and I would always film the main part of the scene in the birthing chamber, wherever I was, whether it was Karnak, whether it was um, uh, you know, um, Luxor, Temple, whether it was you know Medina Habu, it was always in the birthing areas that specific things would happen. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's it's like a great, kind of intuition. Really, yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. This, this place is mad. Like you, even my grip, even like you know how like who there's like the tech technicians, like all the grips. Even they were into it. I mean, we were all like, whoa. You know, it was really funny because we were all together and first being blase, and then everyone kind of did the, oh, actually, this is all making sense, or everyone would feel things. So it was really, because you spend so much time, well, it was only 19 days that we were actually shooting, but we were in that world so intensely that, you know, we had done pre production. So it just kind of, you kind of felt it, you know? Yeah. And other than that, do you like do you feel this stuff? Like, are you a spiritual person generally? <laughs> saying because That's like for me, right. for me, for me, it's yeah. difficult a little bit because I don't believe in this this kind of stuff. I've never felt something like that. So it's some kind of, like you know, you, know, you know. Yeah. So I I do, but I don't force people. I'm just like everyone's their own thing. Okay. But what I love about this film that I wrote, which really came from a dream and it was almost like a, like a psychic download. I, I believe that when you write work, it's not necessarily your work, you're just taking it from somewhere and it just kind of comes through you and you, you write it and you're lucky that you tapped into that. And I think what, what happens is, um, like, I love the fact that when I spoke to very famous archeologists and I asked them, do you have these experiences? They're like, anyone who tells you they don't would be lying you know and when someone that academic and that fact driven says that you feel okay i'm not crazy you know this is kind of you know because like when you look at someone like tarkovsky's movies you know that he's psychic when you watch them right like you can just tell that tarkovsky's got this whole other psychic narrative going on and i believe that a lot of really interesting filmmakers maybe the reason they're drawn to cinema is that cinema's probably one of the few art forms where you can harness it in the subconscious and you don't have to have that awkward discussion about it. It's just there. So people who choose to notice, notice, and others, the film works for them, but they don't know why, you know? You don't have to yeah. scare them about having tapped into this stuff, you know? You can be a little bit psychic and don't be ashamed of that. Like. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> No, but but the funny thing is, like, uh, I've noticed some kind of struggle, like in between the per the, the characters. Not only Hannah, but uh, the team of archaeologists. They were on the ad on on the one hand, they were like, I don't know, giving her that that small statue of cat or what was yeah. that, w talking yeah. about the the power uh, it has. Yeah. On the other hand, they were sitting uh, at lunch, laughing at some tourists fainting at the temple. Yeah, well, and that's, that's like. Thing. Because there's layers, right? Like in everything, there's real things and things, right? And that's the point. People always, it's like with, I don't know, even nationalities, racism, whatever it is, it's like, like right now there's a police siren outside. This is just what we need. Um, <laughs> basically, um, it's like everything has different nuances, different realities, different truths. There are a lot of phony spiritual people who go there, but you know that's their reality in the end. So you kind of just have to leave them with that. Like um, they do things like, I guess, especially in this age where we talk about race and we talk about the Middle East and it's North Africa and it's Arab and it's African and uh, you do get a lot of these um, new age people who are desperately seeking kind of knowledge and they're kind of going about it in a bit of a colonialist way let's say and that's like that's that's an issue for me and it's comic but then you also have like you know the, the woman that I got most of my new age from was really interesting because I googled when I'm when I'm writing scripts I love googling because just this stuff comes up I googled female cult I just Gail Cult Karnak Temple and this woman's name came up so I emailed her and I called her and she was I'm so embarrassed you found that I did that when I was like 30 I'm not into that that's like this random thing but you know what I do do is this and I said to her well how did you get into Egypt and she said to me well you know my husband managed the Grateful Dead and she's like she's American my husband I love this story my husband managed the Grateful Dead so when they did the first ever rock concert in Egypt in, I think it was 78 or something, um, I went and I then went to Luxor and I just 
got hooked and I had to come back. And now she writes these really philosophical books where she uses the iconography and the stories from ancient Egypt to like, like almost like Buddhism or some kind of religion. She like accesses it and makes it really accessible. And it's the similar stories, all of it, like light and dark choices, you know, power, what it means, you know, the source of, uh, you know, religious ideas. And, um, and I found her through this Googling thing and it was just great because she is actually very serious and legit when you listen to her. It's like listening to like a theology, a theologian, right? But then she herself will talk to the nutters that you see, you know, doing weird dances or whatever. But, you know, each to his own, whatever people want to do. But there are some, I just love watching these Egyptian guards and the monuments. I love watching their faces when these like, like, you know, Western European tourists come and start like doing yoga and they're like, what is on? This is hysterical. Like, what are they burying? In the you know, there are all these weird rituals. And I love watching the locals' faces because they're like, oh my God, what is this? So there's also that kind of tension as well. I, I really wanted to access that in the story because in any of these great historic places, you always have those kind of characters and it would be, disin I think, disingenuous to not include them, you know? Yeah. How, how difficult, by the way, was, was to get permission to shoot in, in the temples? It was, you know, I, uh, I shot with the, with the best Egyptian producer, so it was fine. That's great. It was fun as well because we were like an Arab a film. So um, even though it was like a British, so, you know, that was, you know, because I'm obviously British born, there was me, Andrea, and Samir, my DP, and my executive producer, we were all British. But then the whole crew was just Egypt, it was just Egyptians. Um, and we were like an Egyptian film with some foreign actors, you know, and a Kareem who's the male lead, he's Lebanese, born, you know, he speaks fluent Arabic. So it was definitely this really interesting um, kind of, uh, yeah, we felt quite local, you know, and by the end I was laughing, I was directing in Arabic, which was fun. Uh, Cause I never thought, you know, I use Arabic for more like at home and social, I never direct in Arabic, but it was fun directing in Arabic. Um, so yeah, so it was good. Um, so at, at least you were not the crazy Western tourists shooting film. Uh, exactly, you know, <laughs> and it was nice. It was nice that I, yeah, I for once I could like hide and, you know, be, yeah, be, yeah. Cause my name also, a lot of Egyptians are called Zane. It was great really. Yeah. At, at the beginning, you, you've mentioned that you've been to Luxor with your parents when, I don't know, 12, yeah. 13 years old. So uh, I, I kind of like uh, uh, noticed that as, as you were describing, like, basically like the difference or, or how the looks or change since Hannah was uh, there the last time mm. you, you you've used very like <laughs> I really love the details like the old taxi cars and the taxi drivers like she knows mm. them even even though she, yeah. she was there like 20 years ago and they use the same yeah. cars and so on that yeah. even the hotel like uh, it needs the reconstruction refurbishing and she's yeah. still staying in the old one that was really nice that, that is that like how you remember Luxor? You know, I was young and I was probably a bit rebellious. And I was like, you know, listening to my Discman the whole time or my Discman or whatever there was, you know, when you're like a teenager traveling with your parents. Um, so for me, it's not really just Luxor. I'm a very pan-Arab kind of person, probably because I didn't grow up in one Arab country and I have a connection to that part of the world. I feel comfortable wherever I am now, whether it's like Beirut, in the past Damascus, Cairo. You know, I used to go to Cairo a lot. I used to go to, you know, um, but, you know, I hadn't been back to Luxor, but I'd been back to Egypt a lot because Cairo is quite a cool center to go to intellectually, culturally. So, you know, I've always been going there. I've always been going to Beirut. I've always been going to Amman, um, you know. So um, I guess for me, it's more about harnessing that vibe you know that's actually unfortunately probably not going to be there in five years time because already a lot of the taxis would change and i remember i remember i used to see because you know my everyone in, in jordan used to think i'm crazy but i would before the war in syria i would take these things called services which are shared taxis and you'd pay 20 dollars to get the whole front seat so you wouldn't have to share with anyone. And yeah, I'd sit in the front seat of these old, old cars and drive from Amman to Damascus. And then I would change taxis and go to Beirut. And it would take me like a day. But the people I would meet in these, for writing, the people I would meet in these taxis would just like 
like a, a farmer, a woman with a chicken on her lap, who's like the wife of the farmer, and then like a guy who designs belly dancing costumes in Damascus, and then, you know, a waiter from Latakia. And, you know, and it was just like these people. And so I really missed that because, A, that's gone with Syria. When Syria went, we don't, we, I can't do that anymore. You can't drive, or, you know, you would just drive on your own in your own private car, and you could just drive through Syria to the Bay Rivers. So you can't do that anymore. And I just, I just felt this, like, yeah, I felt this deep sense of nostalgia for how wonderfully calm and quiet. So the Middle East is a place, uh, or the Arab world, because obviously this is North Africa, because in the middle of all the craziness, you always find these peaceful, very like spiritual places, and there's, but it's quiet and you get some kind of nourishment from it, whether it's in the Roman ruins in Jalash, you know, or you're in, or you're literally on the like Jordanian, you know, uh, border with, you know, the occupied territory, whatever, occupied territory, wherever it is, there's always somewhere. And I really wanted to harness that because, you know, people always think that if you're surrounded by war, you're going to, it's, or you're in war, it always feels that way, but it's, it's a different energy. It's just constant, like, it's like her PTSD. It's just constant, like, you're, it, you're kind of ill at ease spiritually or intellectually or emotionally. But, um, but then it's so quiet. So it's this kind of strange, strange thing. But I don't know if I'm making any sense. Yeah, yeah, you are, you are. Okay. Let, me, let me have one last question. And I, I admit okay. it's a little bit tabloid-ish. Will, okay. will they have children, Sultan and Hannah? <laughs> what, now? I, I mean, in the future? Yeah. In the future? I mean, I would love them to because that's what I did. <laughs> I had three. <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't know. You have to ask them. Um, uh, maybe they will. If they do. Um, yeah, my baby was on set. My little baby Kareem. He was in the East twenty months, but at the time he was four months or three months. And um, and uh, Hannah and Sultan loved carrying him and playing with him together. So you never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a great movie. I really enjoyed that. Oh, thank you. No, and I'm so sad I can't be with you guys because I've heard it's the most amazing festival and and the place is beautiful and I haven't been to the Czech Republic since I was like, I think 15. Yeah. So, so, so you were, have, you were still the rebellious teenager then, so you have to come again. <laughs> <laughs> I have to come now when I'm more like, sedated. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Bye.